Reset the microphone so I think it's all right. All right, are we all set? All right. We'll start with the individuality and spirituality of Frida Kahlo. And sentence number one reads, the central identity of this individual is very spiritual. It is almost as though she is, in, is perpetually in a state of rapture, feeling toned rapture. All right, that's pretty obvious. When you use the word central identity, you're always talking about the sun. And when you say very spiritual, you mean it, that means not only because it's uh, uh, in aspect with Neptune, but it's in aspect with Uranus also. So when two of the spiritual planets are in touch with the sun, it's somebody that's very, very highly spiritual. And because one of one or another of those planets is going to be activated, it's like being in rapture. Rapture is more of a Neptunian word, though, than, a, than a, an Iranian word. You got a sentence for us, Julie? You didn't do any of them, huh? I'm just going to have to give you a spanking. <laughs> Lulu, do you have any? Oh, how can you do? It, it puts <laughs> That's been done already. Sure. Arthur Miller has a book called The Rosy Crucifixion. And it's Yes, he these uh, there's a book that he wrote called uh, Books and Authors That Have Influenced Me or something like that the title is. The three most influential writers to our, to Henry Miller were Max Heindel, Madame Blavatsky, and Krishnamurti. And, and really, all of those porn works are actually supposed to be about, he was really big on astrology. He had this strange astrologer, which he took pride in, <coughs> in actually tainting the man. But he had this strange astrologer that was, when he was in Paris, that was really, really very sharp. And then he had a dinner party and he invited all of his friends and he invited the strange astrologer and all through dinner the astrologer never said anything and when the dinner was over they, in fact the, the guests were making fun of astrology and everything and when the dinner was over Henry Miller turns to him and says well what do you have to say and he took each person at the uh, party and in effect gave them their entire horoscope from just what he had observed during the time of the party. But then uh, Henry Miller debauched him and uh, I think there's even a book about the debauching of the man because he was a very pure spiritual man and Henry Miller just uh, polluted his life completely. I think it was called uh, uh, something about a paradise or some the fall of somebody from paradise or something. <laughs> The astrologer. Oh. Yeah. No, I don't remember the name. But all you'd have to do is look up a bibliography of Henry Miller. And I never read the Rosy Crucifixion. I think I only read either Tropic of Capricorn or Tropic of Cancer. I never read Nexus or any of those. It was enough for me, you know. I was young and it was it was there was no literary part to it for me. All right. The central identity of this individual is very high energy. She is always revved up and eager for something to do, something exciting to do. What we're talking about here, the central identity again, is the sun. We're talking about the fact that the sun is in the almost exact opposition to Mars. 
That indicates a very, very high energy, and Mars is conjoined to Uranus, which is also opposite the Sun. So you get the uh, eager for something exciting to do. Both Mars and Uranus, uh, Uranus, the lower side of Uranus, love excitement, and that's that's what what it's pointing to. All right. This individual sees herself as unique and different, and sees the individuals off of whom she plays herself the same way. There are no vanilla people in her life. We're talking mostly about the Uranus and Neptune in this. Uh, she sees herself as unique and different. The unique part is always a, a Iranian keyword. A different is always Neptune. It's always strange. And she plays herself off of them. We're talking about the opposition. With the opposition, you play yourself off of other people. Almost any aspect you do, but most especially with the opposition. And uh, there are no vanilla people in her life. I'm, I, I'm not sure she could even have recognized very much of a vanilla person. She's one of those kinds of people that if you were with her, even the vanilla people would have their quirks come out in, uh, in, in the association with her. You know, it's that way with strange people. And I remember a time that I did a hitchhiking trip to go to Chicago. And it was in the beatnik days, and this is just when the uh, eye system was being built. And we started hitchhiking, and we got stuck in Beloit. And we couldn't get a ride and couldn't get a ride. And finally, uh, I said, well, let's go into town. I said, if there's anything that's weird or strange in this town, I'll find it right away. <laughs> And so we go down to downtown Beloit, and I said, I think we want to go in there. And it happened to be the only lesbian bar <laughs> in the entire area. So that, that yeah. Be offended, yes, crazy. to weird That's stuff. Too. Yes, yes. Too. yeah, yeah. What about square Some of that are probably also, depending on how exactly the square is. Okay. He's no longer with us. It was a really tough thing. It was... Uh, he was known in town here. He was a blues and jazz musician. His name was called Flat, Fat Richard Drake. He played for years with Luther Allison when Luther Allison used to tour. And uh, it was one of the most humiliating moments of my life because in those days I was pretty, uh, pretty wild. And I got him started with using marijuana. And from marijuana, he went to everything else. And I had, in the meantime, left town and had to be completely cleaned up, vegetarian, everything. And then I come back to Madison, and I walk into the Rathskeller. And he, in the meantime, has been in the hippie scene in San Francisco He's used so many drugs that teeth are falling out of his mouth and he had a heart attack at age 40 and things like that. And he comes up to me in the rat skiller and pats me on the back and he says, this is the man who did it all for me. <laughs> I could have sunk into the ground at that time. Was he the one who had nothing but trying Yes, yes. Boy, you're intuitive. So I remember, you talked yeah. about, you talked about oh, okay. you were like, so What are those arm things? They're cool. Aren't they? Yeah. They're very functional. If you think wool is sexy, there is that. Yeah. All right, all right. We're never going to get anywhere <laughs> with this. <laughs> All right, compiling all of the above strong tendencies, one can see this as a very complex individual who may present a different face every time one encounters her. This is because she is so, this is so, this is because she is so creative, but whatever she, way she chooses herself, one can be sure it will not be tepid. So we're saying then that having all of these many aspects indicate this is somebody very, very complicated. Just having aspects to Uranus and Neptune alone is enough to be complicated. Yeah, but to have all of those different kinds, we're saying that, uh, you know, it's very, very different. All right, any question? The sentences are, this time are pretty straightforward. Number five, 
Because the center of her being is so multiplex, she requires many friends and associates. Oh, that's supposed to be of many stripes. I thought I had them all out of there, but I didn't. Many stripes and many lovers, some of whom are likely to be outrageous. All right, we're talking about the fact that the opposition takes place between the 11th and the 5th house. The 11th house being friends and the 5th house being lovers. And she requires both of them, to, uh, you know, uh, numbers of both of them, uh, in, order to, uh, in order to express all the different sides of her being. Some of her lovers may try to dominate in a vigorously paternalistic way, and she will respond in kind with a, with a style that is unexpected. All right, the lovers is the fifth house. Mars tries to dominate, and Capricorn is very paternalistic. And she'll respond in kind, saying that she's got that opposition, that she'll flip back and forth, but she'll use the Uranus in such a way that it's unexpectable. This is somebody that you never know what is going to be coming next. In her innermost being, she has a delicate piece filled with Oh my goodness, the whole word missing. Filled with and productive of diverse imaginations, which in turn excite her into a metamorphic reverie in such a way that subtle deflections of consciousness become whirlpools of emotional excitement. All right, working from the back forward, the whirlpools of emotional excitement are because of the cancer. And we're saying that she gets into a reverie because of the Sun and Neptune, which is a strange kind of peaceful kind of thing. And from that, she produces imagination. And imagination is a word that you have to use with this horoscope because of both the Cancer and because of the Neptune. And so she starts imagining things and they put her into, you know, there are some people that can just sit there with their imagination and create picture after picture. Some people, like Carl Jung, try to use it as a psychological therapy. That you, It's called uh, active imagination. You start an imaginative scenario, and you work off the problems of your life, but you do it in some kind of form, like a mythical form, or a make-believe form of one kind or another. And that's what we're trying to, to get at here. Once she gets those things going, they become quite exciting and then that it brings in the opposite side of the, of the business. All right. The generosity of her personal emotional outpourings attract exciting people to her, many of whom thrive on excitement for its own sake. And if she extends herself to them too extremely, she may find herself drawn out in a way that she loses her more contemplative center and seeks for excitement itself. This is a likely syndrome of behavior, an emotional seesaw with all sorts of high and low, low action and peace through which she sees and becomes herself. We're now trying to make a dynamic of what her conscious life is like. Uh, she has impersonal emotional outpourings. We're talking here about the 11th house. Wants to be impersonal. But at the same time, she attracts from the opposite. Anytime you go in one direction, you bring up the absolute opposite, even if there's not an opposition aspect there. If you just have a strong planet and it starts manifesting, it brings up something from the opposite sign in house. Excitement for its own sake is Uranus and Mars. The Uranus especially is the abstract ruler of the 11th house, which are things done for their own sake. And she extends herself to them too extremely. Extension is the opposition. And the extremity is because of the extremely strong aspects in the opposition. So she will have herself in a syndrome that she'll go way up in excitement and then she'll seek peace to the point that she almost becomes uh, uh, hallucinative. And, <coughs> and then she gets drawn out and goes back and forth like that. She does learn about herself in the process, but it's not a peaceful kind of learning. 
Some things she does, she does for their own things. But those same things are also expressed outwards, and when they are, they are stimulation, and that stimulation reflects back to her, and in part she is motivated by external ex uh, excitement and sometimes cannot tell the difference until she is empty and implodes for a new cycle. This is again talking about the same pattern, because it's the pattern of her whole, whole life, and we want to look at it as many ways as possible. The things she does for their own sake, that's talking uh, expressly about the 11th house. But she also has to express them outwardly, and the expression comes both from the 11th and the 5th house. But when she does start expressing them outwardly and they become personal expressions, they become stimulating. And when they're stimulative, they reflect back to her again, saying that the opposite side comes, you see yourself in your, in your opposite side people. And then she is motivated from external excitement. And sometimes she can't tell the difference of where it's originating from, from within or from without. And so she keeps getting excited until the conjunction causes her to implode inward in a quiet kind of peace and she feels empty and then when you're empty, you can start imagining anew. All fairly simple, but it's very hard to live through, and the manifestations that come out of it are very complex. Number 10. This is a person who is in turmoil in the heart of her being because she is trying to unify so many things, and some of those things are not given to unification and would rather explode in independence than come to rest in concord. Thus, these outward tendencies to produce strong individualism as well as strong individuality. We're again talking about the same thing. This is the whole of the spirituality and individuality is primarily in the same aspect pattern. She's in the turmoil in the heart of her being because she's, the sun always tries to unify everything. And she's trying to unify so many different things, and some of them don't like being unified. Uranus wants to be independent. Mars wants to be a cowboy. It wants to go off and do its own thing. And so some of those, you know, you cannot unify something that doesn't want to be unified. And so she doesn't find the peace that she wants. And so these outward things of independence produce individualism, which is very different than individuality. Individualism is not capable of cooperating and working with others, whereas individuality is capable of that because in individuality you recognize it's the same spirit and you should be able to work with everyone in that, in that same spirit. So the Mars and Uranus are definitely individualistic, but not necessarily individuated in a spiritual sense. All right. She probably sees herself as a peaceful, reflective, spiritual individual. Those who interact with her and who are her feedback people probably see her as unpredictable, supercharged, driven, and even demanding. Both are correct and both have only a partial view. The seeing herself is directly what you get from the sun. And the sun and Neptune, you know, Neptune can put you in a passive state that's something like a torpor. And in Cancer, it's like she gets into that kind of a long-lasting spiritual mood and she sees herself as a peaceful person. The people on the outside are more like the Uranus Mars people and they, to her, you know, they, everything seems unpredictable, supercharged, in overdrive, all of those kinds of things. And the thing is with oppositions, oppos people have a lot of oppositions. Some people see one side and some people see another side. And there are a lot of partial views with such people. All right. Like many creative and expressive people, she has an extremely divided character and extremely divided self. Pretty self-evident sentence, doesn't need anything. The only thing to say is, is that creative people are people who uh, are very divided. 
And it is in that inner struggle that their creative ideas are born. If you're dealing with an unruly uh, lower nature, sometimes the only way that you can escape that lower nature is through a higher imagination. Or if you try to overcome it, you have to be very inventive in finding ways uh, to overcome it. All right? I, I put a couple of short sentences in there so that you don't have to think that uh, writing astrological uh, uh, sentences has to be something very complicated. Now, the next one has a bunch of sentences run together. The greatest difficulty this individual faces is inconsistency. That's the case with the opposition. We are all very different people, but not so radically different that we are fundamentally divergent in our inner being. And that's saying that not, most, not many people have that very fundamental split very deep down in within, uh, which this opposition is. We all need variety, but if there is too much variety and it is too extremely varied, it becomes difficult to accomplish anything. This is a character that begs for unification, but also a character that may resist unification being in love with radical changes, especially of old ways and addicted to swoons of emotional enthusiasm. Again, talking about the same opposition. The first three sentences are uh, lead-up sentences. They all apply to her, but it leads up to the last sentence, which is really about her. It's a character that begs for unification because you can't be a fence sitter. You have to be either one way or the other or you have to come to a balance. But it's a character that resists unification because it loves radical things. That's the Mars Uranus. Especially it likes the change of the old ways. Uranus in uh, Capricorn doesn't want the new ways. It wants to take those old ways. It wants the new ways. It wants to take those old ways and change them even if it requires a Molotov cocktail. And swoons of emotional enthusiasm, we're talking about the Mars-Neptune opposition, would be a swoon of emotional enthusiasm. She rides a pendulum of joy and sorrow, and the sources of both are uncertain and may even change places fairly obvious. Nothing, nothing more I can say. These sentences are pretty self-evident. Uh, number 15, between or within mood swings, she gets glimpses of herself and her creative abilities. She is very hard to keep up with because one doesn't know whether to expect uncanny insights into one's soul as a result of her friendship or flashes of creative eclat amidst violent outbursts or destructive amusements. These are all party to her self-discovery and unfoldment. Yes, that sentence was written for you. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I had you in mind when I put the word in there. We're talking about mood swings. Cancer is mood. She gets glimpses of herself Ah, sometimes when she's on the cancer side of things, sometimes in the switch. And her creative abilities. The creative abilities have to do with the 5th and 11th house being creative houses and with Uranus being very, very highly creative. But you don't know when she's going to get come with uncanny insights, which is the sun conjoined Neptune. She, by knowing herself, she knows other people really well. And the flashes of creative eclat are the Uranus in the fifth house. And uh, the outbursts of destructive amusement are the Mars-Uranus conjunctions, are like our explosions in, in, in amusements. These are all party to her self-discovery and unfoldment. Again, they all reflect on the sun. The specific will is another story. In it, she is generally dark and heavy and even emotionally obsessive, and she doesn't let go of any of these tendencies, even though there may be minor buzzing oscillations of a desire to change. All right. Not, we're dealing now, when we say specific will and not general will, we're speaking of Pluto. 
It's dark and heavy because Saturn and Pluto are in a square. And emotionally obsessive because Venus is in that square and the square takes Saturn in Pisces into account. There might be minor buzzing oscillations. That comes from the Gemini thing, but the minor buzzing oscillations are just a little a fuzz or fluff or something like that. It's not like the big swings that come from the opposition. In general, you can take that as an astrological rule that unless there is something magnifying it, the things of common signs the oscillations are small, whereas opposition the oscillations are usually very, very big. Do you have a question? Okay. Yes. Uh, usually. I don't like to say that there is a standard interpretation, but if you're looking for a standard interpretation, uh, balance is probably the best. In some cases, I have actually seen that, but usually then there's a planet to an, uh, an aspect to an outside planet where you have to choose one thing or the other. Some astrologers always say that with the opposition, that you either choose one side or the other, and I, go, I think that's denying part of your existence, though in some cases it has to be that way. You know? You can't be married and single at the same time. It's, it's, you know, a lot of oppositions have that. Uh, can you be friends and lovers at the same time? Maybe after a long time, but uh, you know those, those kinds of things. You can't be above and below, like the uh, tenth house and the fourth house. You can't be both at the same time. Okay. The last sentences. It is if her will is dedicated to the purpose of loving and she has an almost fatal destiny to love, which all may be an obsession to compensate for the incapacity of much personal love to match what she experiences in a higher, higher creative love. So she hunkers down and fixes herself in something more mundane personally to weather the storm of radical discovery and self-creativity. Since we only give it two sentences, I thought the second one or the last one for, for, the, for the Pluto part had to be a whopper. Uh, Pluto is dedicated, makes really no other aspects except with the Saturn part. And so you can say then that the only down to earth planet in the combination really is Venus. And you can say then that the will is dedicated to the purpose of loving. And because Saturn and Pluto are both so fatalistic, you might say that she has a fatal destiny to love. Now we're trying to tie it together with the other opposition business, and we say that this might be an obsession to love because in the personal love, maybe she doesn't feel the same capacity that she does in those wild throes of Iranian love where she does all of the creativity and things like that. And so she hunkers down, like the Saturn and Pluto, like she says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love no matter what. And uh, so she hunkers down and fixes herself into that in her personality, and she hopes to get through that. And uh, in, in doing that, she can get through all of the creative ups and downs and the pendulum of joy and sorrow and all of that and uh, be a somewhat normal person. You know, there are very few people that are different, weird people that really want to be different and weird people. Very often they long for, uh, they long for ordinary everyday experiences. I've heard interviews with Jack Benny when he was in the prime of his fame. And, you know, he could command huge television audiences and he was very, very wealthy and everything else. In an, in an interview, he would say, boy, I had a good towel at the clubhouse today. Meaning to say that those little down-to-earth things became extremely meaningful to him because, you know, I, what can you say anymore about, you know, about being in front of the world that much and just having a simple love and hanging on to a simple love or obsessing on wanting a simple love uh, in the face of all of the unpredictability and creativity 
uh, is, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not an irrational thing. See, there, uh, we're leading now to what we're going to start doing next with the sentences. With the sentences, the next set of sentences, we take all of the different parts of the character and we make summary sentences. And you better have summary sentences next time. <laughs> you, yes? The obsession or obsessive factor when it comes to food, which aspect is most, uh, or acts most obsessive? Where are the conjunction, the opposition? The conjunction. What? Yes, because usually with obsessions, you get stuck on one thing, and the conjunction is a making it one thing. Whether it, whether it is a lover or a can crusher. <laughs> Do you have any sentences, Hila? No. <laughs> Okay. All right, let's look at the second set of sentences. You're familiar with Frida Kahlo, aren't you? You are familiar with Frida Kahlo. Okay. A movie on her. Yeah, oh. Oh, she had accidents that her, her spine was shattered. She learned to paint when she was in a body cast, basically. Ah. Paralysis is the Pluto part. Yeah, yeah. The accidents part is Mars or Uranus. No, no doubt about that. That that's clear. But, yeah. And the the strongest obsession is not the sun in Pluto. The strongest obsession is the moon in Pluto. Uh, of general obsession, moon in Pluto. I don't know why it's because the moon is the most subjective and Pluto is the most objective. And when you put them together in a conjunction, it just you know that's that's the people who will have a a rug like for this whole room. And they'll get down on their hands and knees with a little tiny comb, and they'll make sure that every fiber of that rug paint points just in the direction they want it to point. That that's that that's an obsessive character. All right. We are looking at Michel Montaigne, all of whose essays Ela has read. <laughs> We, we get, see, the object of this class is to draw everybody into the class in participation in some way or another. And if teasing is the only way to... Mark is a little bit hard sometimes, but we'll even get to Dale yet before the night is over. He puts his head immediately down inside. <laughs> All right. This is the horoscope of another in the throes of discomfort as part of the process of being born into selfhood. We're talking about somebody here who has a conflicted son. That's all the sentence says. It's as simple as can be. The sun is again in conjunction with Neptune, but it's opposite to the moon and it's square to Jupiter. So this is somebody who has a conflicted self-image. All right. This individual strives through the mists of the loftiest spiritual spheres, and he must do so before the eyes of the world, especially of the higher classes, a, a spiritual celebrity, <laughs> if that were possible. All right, the loftiest spheres means the highest part of the horoscope, which would be right up near the midheaven. And the fact that he must do so before the eyes of the world means that it's more likely in the 10th house than the 9th house. And when you say the uh, highest classes of society, you surely mean the highest classes. A spiritual celebrity, if that were possible, I don't know whether there is such a thing, really. All right. Yes. When you 
they say the highest class, if you're sure we mean the highest class, maybe we mean to say the 10th house. Uh, they meant to say the 10th house. Because in his time, he was associated with the highest classes. If a king wanted to go on a trip, or if a duke wanted to go on a trip, he got Montaigne to go with him. Because Montaigne would know everything about everything that happened on the trip and would be able to write about it. Which means the king might very well have himself written about, but he didn't know Montaigne because Montaigne was so much into himself that he wrote only about himself. <laughs> All right, that's what an essay is, writing about everything uh, uh, from your own point of view. He cannot conceive of himself as being anything other than a spiritual being. As a being sensitive to and part of spirit in ways of which he has a vague understanding that is decidedly otherworldly. The entire sentence is dedicated to the fact that the sun is conjoined Neptune in Pisces. Nothing more. When you can't get outside of something, that's usually the conjunction. The conjunction has a very myopic way about it. And the Neptune part and the Pisces part are extremely sensitive. And he has a vague understanding that Pisces and Neptune, again, also do not understand uh, things uh, in a critical way way with, with uh, you know, very sharp departures. It can only see things in what we would call a vague way. Because of his experience of the divine presence in his central being, he may suffer delusional beliefs about himself in his manifest and available self, which delusions are born of false optimism. <coughs> The sun can join Neptune, <clears throat> meaning to say that he ha experiences the divine in himself. It's not a matter of a belief, it's a matter of experience. But he might be delusional, and delusional usually comes when Neptune is uh, afflicted. And in this case, we're talking about the uh, very strong square with Jupiter, and uh, Jupiter magnifies things, and when things get magnified, they get distorted. And uh, the delusions are born out of false, uh, false optimism. This is not like if it were under another person. This could very likely be uh, a social alcoholic, because all of the false optimism and delusions and things like that are there. You know the horoscopes of all alcoholics already. <laughs> All right. In his inner being, he may experience euphoria and the contentment of divine felicity so that he will almost always seem inwardly upbeat, if not with a good sense of relevancy, so that he is pleasant company even when leading one astray. <laughs> All right, the euphoria is the Neptunian. And the conjunction, he comes to contentment, comes to spiritual peace. And because of that, he's positive, he's upbeat. But he doesn't have a good sense of relevancy. He's got the moon that's uh, whispering to him from the subconscious because it's been denied and he's got the squares to Jupiter, uh, which means he's uh, abstracting or blowing things out of proportion. And uh, so he seems pleasant. That's, you know, Jupiter aspects are like that. They seem pleasant even when they're not. And if he's leading you astray, it will be a very pleasant being led astray. Felicity is a sort of a joy or happiness. It's more of a Latin word. Like when we say Merry Christmas, in Latin languages they say Feliz Navidad. They say uh, uh, happiness. Yes. You saying? Uh, the moon is you said, denied. No. The, yeah. It's it's not. You know. It. He's so much an authority that he denies that what's happening in the subconscious. But we're coming to that in, in, in future sentences. Yeah. I don't. Want, I want to be a premature. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. Because of his fascination with the big picture, even to euphoric excess, he may try to gloss over details, but his subconscious will not allow them. And though, it may e though he may even become fascinated with detail, but not without trying to gloss over or tediously trying to bend some aspects of it. This is not a scientist who lets the facts speak for themselves. His fascination with the big picture, the fascination part is the Neptune and the Pisces, and the big picture is Jupiter. The euphoric excess means that bubbling over with the happiness, that's crazy, but he may try to gloss over details. Exaggeration always tries to do that. But you cannot deny the part of his being that is fundamental, and that's the moon in the... Uh, fourth house, you can't deny any part of yourself. And as part of this aspect, he can't try to uh, uh, over, you know, he can't gloss over the details. So he might even become fascinated with them as an escape from too much attention in the 10th house sense. But it's still the tendency is there to try to gloss over the things that don't fit his theory. All right. Now our next sentence again looks at even more of the moon in the uh, fourth house in Virgo. He may constantly try to fit things into boxes of his belief system, but he will probably be unsuccessful because he is always changing and some of the change comes because of his almost constant vacillation about what his belief system really is. The trying to fit things into boxes is the moon in the Virgo in the fourth house. It's like every little box, you know, like all you know, those people that have got those cabinets with all the little uh, herbs and things like that. That's sort of what the moon in Virgo in the fourth house is like. Uh, but it will be unsuccessful because he's always changing. That's because of the opposition part. And his almost constant vacillation, the square is not enough to hold it down, there's still vacillation. He won't know what his belief system really is. It's always, it's always in a state of change. His view of himself, of society, of the world is large and big spirited, so much so that it may be distorted. And if it is, it will be bizarre. We're talking here just about uh, the, um, the tenth house position again. The, uh, the view of himself is the sun with Neptune. Of society is the tenth house. The world at large is the tenth house in Jupiter. He's very big spirited, but if you're, if you're too blown up in that way, things again become distorted. And when that happens, if you're thinking about yourself, it gets kind of bizarre. All right, he might be so internal in his self-consciousness that the only way he has any concept of himself is through the eyes of the world which can help him to have an impersonal spiritual self-image, but it leaves him without a lot of opportunity to know himself in his personality unless he can retreat into his home life and deflate his overblown self-concept with down-to-earth chores about which he can become equally overblown. <laughs> and the, yeah, it, it's funny, but it's, it's the, way, the way it goes. When you're before the world, even without having the Neptune there, it's very hard to have a concept of yourself because you're always dealing with the world. You're always dealing with celebrity image and you're always dealing with people are, are what they're projecting on you. And it's very hard to really know yourself. You know, if, if that combination were in the 12th house, then he could retreat and he could uh, be inward and come to know himself that way. But it, it, that just isn't available to him. So the only way that he has to know himself is through his personality, which means he has to go down through the moon into the Virgo part and, you know, like doing little chores day by day by day is the way that uh, he gets a more realistic view of himself. 
But of course, then the problem is with this type of character that the moon is also square to Jupiter and all the little things become excessive also. So what we're talking about here is somebody who may be able to expound at great length and in great magnitude about the things of the world and then come home and uh, be real petty about how the wine casks are stored or something like that and become all carried away in that and so it can be overblown in that as well. That's what happens when you have Jupiter in, in a T-square situation like this. The, the, what, what? Yes, the personality through the uh, moon. Not only through the ascendant, through the moon. The moon, in this case, rules the ascendant as well. And, okay. All right. Number 10, which unfortunately is divided on two sides of the page. In his, ability, in his ability to spiritually adapt, he is like a fish that can swim at any depth because it can inflate or deflate its bladder to match whatever the external pressure may be. And he does this by psychically attuning himself to his psychic or spiritual environment. One would think that this would make him vulnerable to being swept away, which is a real possibility and would even be likely if he did not have a secret reserve of will to control his sensitivity and determine his course objectively. The salvation of self in this horoscope lies in the power of will. All right, now we've brought in the last element that deals with the sun, and that is that the sun is sextile to Pluto. Now, we're talking because the T-square is common sign, it's adaptive. And because the self-image focused through the sun is in Pisces, and so he is like, uh, so he's like a fish. The inflation or deflation uh, comes from Jupiter. And so he has this psychic way of attuning himself to his environment. But the thing is about common sign people, they're most likely to dereliction. Pisces itself is the sign of alcoholism. And being derelict, you know, like, well, hey guys, let's go out and have a drink, and a person gets carried away and lets go of their responsibilities. And there is a possibility of that in this T-square. But fortunately, he has the sextile to Pluto, and the sextile to Pluto indicates that he has the willpower that he can draw on something inside of himself and not get carried away. You look like you have a question. Yeah, so the sex power in this case is beneficial. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but it's not a sextile trine because it's out of, uh, out of orb with uh, the moon, which would make it a totally different kind of pattern. I don't have a chart for Neptune is in the tenth house with the sun. In Pisces, yeah, it's an unusual thing because uh, Pluto is in uh, uh, Aquarius, the very first degrees of Aquarius, and it's it's a hangover kind of uh, sextile. Okay, where are we here? Oh, number eleven. The power of will does not extend, however, to the picayune tendencies of the subconscious mind that gets carried away with details that nag at the self-image so they may run rampant until they run amok. All right, well, that's, that's a sentence that's purely astrological. We're saying that Pluto does not aspect the moon. And the moon is those picky and tendencies that uh, want to nag and nag and nag because they require attention. And because they don't have that disciplining effect of Saturn, they may just run on and on and on until they run amok because it is a T-square and it's, there's likely a problems. And running amok probably is uh, a good thing to, to describe an opposition to Pisces. All right, 12, the patience brought into the consciousness by the deliberate use of will introduces an element of science to his mystic consciousness that may, 
direct him away from an otherwise overly churchy predisposition. We're talking exclusively here about the fact that the sextile is between Uranus, which is a scientific sign, and Pisces, which is a sign of belief. And uh, so what we're, what we're talking about here is that he's way churchy with all of the Pisces things, and this, this uh, bringing in of a scientific control of things uh, uh, brings in some, a very different kind of consciousness to him. Similarly, his intuition and creativity seems to be introducing new impressions <coughs> into the world as a relief from deep-set old ways of thinking that are accurate but backward-looking. All right, now we have moved to Uranus. We're saying that uh, uh, the intuition is Uranus. It's in the first house, and he likes giving birth or introducing new impressions into the world. The impression is the cancer part. As a relief from deep-set old ways, and the deep-set old ways is Saturn in the 12th house. And so he, why, all right, and uh, so they're backward looking, and they're looking to the past. All right, number 14. Any, uh, so any questions so far? Okay. His mind is captivated with ingenious ways of stating things in a personal but different way, an intuitive way. And while he may think he is thinking of orthodox things, he is actually introducing radical new impulses. This is a man right in the heart of the Renaissance. The mind, we're talking about Mercury. It is trying to uh, this planet on the ascendant. So it's captivated with this transition from old ways to new things. And the mind itself is still in the ninth house, and he may th be thinking, think he's thinking about orthodox things, about religious things, but what's actually happening is he's bringing in new thoughts. That's the best kind of discovery. In fact, that's, the, that's a genuine kind of discovery when it just seems to be natural to you, and you're just thinking, you're talking about what's all there in the first place. You know, it is an affected individual who has to put on a pose of being different. The really different kind of person is somebody who just is basically different and thinks they're normal. <laughs> you know, the, the, the <laughs> 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 yeah. Jerry is one of those people that is so orthodox, he's unorthodox. I've run into one more than that. That one was a George. And that, this George was worked in. Uh, you know, like underwriter of laboratories or things like that. People would bring in products, and he would design machines to test those products. And he made, uh, everything he made was a new thing. But he was so orthodox and so regular that it was peculiar. You know, like you thought, boy, this guy is really, really odd. Uh, but that's, you know, <laughs> that, that shows the theory of individuality as being a natural kind of thing. All right. Number 15. In the central spirituality and in the raw creativity, we see personal subjectivity, albeit unusual subjectivity, so that his expressions and his presentation of himself will always have a homey quality about him, which will probably be endearing because comfortable. All right, the central spirituality is the sun. The raw creativity is Uranus. The uh, subjectivity of the sun comes from the opposite, and the subjectivity of Uranus comes from the cancer quality so that when he's presenting himself either personally through the ascendant or when he's ex just expressing himself in spirit he'll have a homey quality about him and this is this is why he's such a pleasant person to be around because you feel at home with him all right number 16 the spirituality 
and the creativity will also have an emotionally smooth way about them which will also make them more acceptable. When he is an authority, he is accepted as such because his authority can be felt. We're talking exclusively about the water sign dominance of the character and the fact that the moon gets mixed in. Uh, the water signs are always smooth. They uh, don't like rough, jarring edges or things like that. And when we're talking about the central spirituality, it's the sun, and the raw creativity is uh, Uranus. Uh, creativity in general. All right, number 17. His mental precision is fine, but not enough to completely overcome the vague and indefiniteness of his overall spiritual consciousness, which carries an uncanny truth about it despite its nebulosity. Yeah. All right, uh, mental precision, we're talking about the sun trying Saturn. It's a fairly good, strong aspect. It's a trine uh, with a two-degree orb. It's uh, I'm a Mercury trine in Saturn. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, mental precision. I'm, it's a right thought, wrong word. Uh, it's mental precision. All right. It's it's very fine, but the other tendencies, the. Uh, Piscean tendencies, the Neptunian tendencies, and the exaggeration thereof by Jupiter uh, are uh, so expansive and so indefinite. This is somebody who doesn't like to come to too much of a conclusion or to be too definite. Uh, but even despite all of that, because he has the intuition, the Neptune uh, Sun intuition, when he's speaking as an authority, the 10th house is as an authority, he, you will feel it because you feel it in your emotions and it'll be uncanny. The, the Neptune is very uncanny uh, and that's all, in all of the Pisces part of it is the nebulosity. Yes. Felt or how would you no. define it? No, it, it would be uh, almost pushed on you. The fire signs make no ifs, ands, or buts about things. This is the way it is. It is a spirited kind of assertion. It is an expression that you would feel, not necessarily that you were attacked, but you would be, you would know that you would you had been told something if it were from a fire sign authority. This you would get that uncanny feeling of truth, even though something may be very weird and bizarre. Somehow you know deep down inside that it is true, and that's more what this would be like. There's, there's a uh, hunch isn't quite the right word because hunch is a little too Iranian. But the Neptunian is you, you, you have that suspicion that it is true. Okay. It is not clear whether his tendencies to generalization and exaggeration help him to convey the immensity, grandeur, and power of things of the spirit or whether they distract by making them and his individuality to be something clownishly absurd, a buffoon. After all, there are some things that are so glorious that they cannot be exaggerated and he may well experience them. This is a question saying that we don't know. You're not always going to know with astrology. You know, there's, there's some things that are up in the air. If the, if the person himself doesn't even know, and if it's completely uh, creative, if, even if it is that way for divinity, that divinity doesn't know what, what is going to come out of its creation, but it knows that it will be good, and it's certain of all of that, 
And so if there's a divine uncertainty, uh, astrological, we have to be able to have that uncertainty too. And so what we're saying with, uh, with this kind of sentence, this is again leading toward next time when we talk about tying everything all together, what we're saying is, yes, there are tendencies to exaggerate from, from Jupiter. It tends to blow things up and bring a, a, an attitude of grandeur about them. If you exaggerate too much, then you do your harm, your, your cause harm, because nobody's going to believe you. And that's a possibility with them. And if that is the case, it gets to be somebody like, uh, how, we all went to the Shakespeare play and we saw Falstaff. And Falstaff was always over-exaggerating that he made a buffoon of himself, that people laughed at him for his exaggerations. But on the other hand, with this person, you don't know for certain, because he may be having spiritual experiences that are so wonderful, so glorious, that you can't exaggerate them in what may seem like uh, buffoonery or uh, exaggeration aren't even coming close to what the reality is because it's so, so great you can't exaggerate it. So there are, you have to always have some, uh, you know, some unknowns. It is said that when the great spiritual teachers put a trial to somebody who is up for initiation, they don't know what the outcome is going to be because it is at that point where, the, where it's, it's, it's the part of the person's character that is critical but is not known. It's, you know, it's a defining moment. You're, you're given a situation that either you can become great or you can become infamous and uh, you, you don't always know. A lot of the worst uh, and most evil magicians are people who were up for initiation but didn't make it or do, who demanded it too soon and they couldn't get past the critical moment like that and then they used all of their soul power in, to satisfy a hunger for a real experience by doing all kinds of evil magic and things like that, which never satisfied them. Okay. What's that? It sounds very new age, yeah. some of the stuff that sounds so incredible. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. He is at home with his spirituality d despite the internal division through which it develops. Basically saying that he doesn't have to doubt whether he's spiritual. He's at home, he knows he's spiritual, and no matter what happens, no matter what his mind comes up with or whatever, he will always be at home with his spirituality. Uh, in, despite it all. Uh, no, I think just the sun Neptune alone is enough for that. Yeah. 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 All right. These are your uh, assignments for next week. Do we have an example of how you have to be Yes, you have the book in the book. <laughs> yes. Are you a burner statement from one of his movies? Mark and I have talked about that uh, before. The act of writing is an act of finalization. When you have put it all the way down in writing, it's finalized. And in a lot of cultures, especially in Arabic cultures, some things are written in the Book of Destiny, so to speak. And you cannot, uh, you cannot overcome them. They're going to happen no matter what you do. So uh, it's fatalistic like, like the Twelfth House is. But the act of writing is like that. I used to have to fight with a superstition to not write things because uh, I was afraid that once written, because I've seen it happen, I, I've seen artists <coughs> whose studios are filled with their artwork and then their, their creative life dies because they, they see all of their accomplishments. And if they're not there, 
then you, you know, you always have something new that you have to be doing. And I didn't want to write things because what happens is when you write things, you say, I've said it, it is written. And when it is written, then you tend to not continue to, uh, uh, to uh, develop the thinking and go the next step further. But I have found since then that if you write tentatively and you keep your attitude like, well, this is the latest installment, this is as I see it now, then, there, then you're, it's always right, there's always new material. And it, just because it is written, that part may be written. The best example uh, that I can think of something being written is from the movie Lawrence of Arabia. They're going through the hottest part of the Arabian desert, and they have to do it at night because you can't get through it in the daytime. It's so hot. It's like where it gets to 120 degrees and such like that. And one of the men in the party, uh, when, they, when they get to the other side, one of the men in the party is missing. And he apparently lagged and is somewhere out in, in that scorching heat. And Lawrence of Arabia says, I'll go and get him. And the Arabs think he's crazy. And he goes, you know, they, they, this, that's what they say to him. It is written. He was supposed to die. And, and uh, being Christian and being a believer in free will, he doesn't take that. And so he goes in the daytime, he goes out into that hottest part, gets the man and carries him back. And when he comes back, all of the Arabs cheer him, and they consider him as really some very special man. That, but that evening, while they're making dinner, the man whose life he saved gets into a squabble with somebody and kills uh, somebody. And then the chieftains come to him and say, according to our law, which is in the Quran, if one of our clan gets killed, it is our duty to kill somebody from the other clan. And uh, it, they explained to him that you're going to have nobody left because one's going to kill one and then the other clan's going to come back and kill the other and there'll be nobody left. And they tell him there is only one solution. And so Lawrence of Arabia has to take the man take him around to the other side of the bluff and he has to take a pistol and blow his brains out. And he's you know, the, man, the man that he did everything to save. And he comes back and the people all know how he feels and they say to him, it was written. So yeah, there are some things that are, that there is things that are written that it's very hard, usually fixed sign things, usually things that involve Saturn or things that involve Pluto. Yep. In the process. Yes. When you write something down, you can see whether your thoughts were absurd or not, and you can analyze them in a way that you can't when they're in your head. That's an experience I've had many times over. It is important to write them down. And you can, you can extend and you can go further, yes. Mm -hmm. Next week I want sentences. You got it. <laughs> I promise. We're okay. <laughs> Hila's <laughs> Elo's just stepped into this has been going on for weeks and weeks. It gets to be a pretty wild class sometimes. But she hasn't objected. She hasn't objected. Oh, you want a copy of it? I wanted a copy of it. 
it's just my copy. You can take it. Oh, okay. I got them on the computer. Can you 